guy. Don't you wish to see the ghost? I wish to see the ghost. See the ghost. I wish to not see the ghost. <laughs> Good afternoon, my nickels and dimes. I've been very busy this week. Despite being a big baby piss boy, piss pants boo boo, I have somehow unlocked a crumb of inner strength I did not know I possessed. My inner resolve. Horror games usually eat me up from the inside. Sure, they leave me quaking like a dog behind a plastic bag. But horror games where I have the opportunity to be an impressive nerd? Sign me up. Yeah, jump scares have me sleeping with the lights on at 27 years old, but jump scares except I have a journal explaining to me which jump scare means which. Whether that was the scream of a banshee or just a bog standard haunting scream. Whether that cup that just flew up my head in a silent pitch black garage was from a poltergeist or a demon. I found my calling today, friends. Four player cooperative ghost hunting games. After having phasmophobia recommended to me by someone who's given me far too many lifts not to have to earn the gracious title of friend, I quickly found myself falling in love with a genre I did not know existed. I gobbled up everything Phasmophobia had to offer for the better part of a hundred hours, rinsed it clean, then scoured the Steam library for more content. I also received a key from Unseen Interactive, so shout out to them. After several weeks of scholarly work, i.e. squealing with my grown adult friends in the dark, I have put together a discussion of three titles that I considered to be not only cornerstones of the genre, but also had enough diversity between them that they could be compared with no definitive winner. Apples and oranges are still fruit, after all. Today I would like to introduce you to Phasmophobia, Forsake, and Demonologist and the PPP scale. Premise, presentation, and replayability. We'll run them by each of the P's, then summarize at the end in one final big comparison. Expect tons of critique. After all, sometimes the games with the best promise can just need an extra push. And also make sure to subscribe to my Patreon for early access to videos like this, plus five minute reviews of basically every game I've ever touched. Now, let's get on with the video. And a huge thank you in particular to Alice Teeters, Bail Homar Hofuth, Brendan, Brody Cullen, Carl DeRocha, Duck, Fosh, Julia, Carissa Fulcher, Sam Jones, and Liquid Pliskin for being my highest tier patrons. Hello again everyone and welcome back to another video sponsored by Brilliant. Brilliant have brilliantly decided to partner with us again for another video and I wanted to offer a massive thank you to them for their support and also urge all of you watching today to consider making use of Brilliant services in helping better yourself through a library of fantastic online lessons. One of the best ways to learn is through a service like Brilliant which delivers comprehensive interactive learning, teaching you with the building blocks whilst constantly testing you with puzzle solving exercises in an environment that rewards gradual progress. Having lessons broken down into bite-sized segments gives you achievable milestones and personal goals, whether or not you want to crack on with one per day or for a set number of hours per week, you know, however you learn best. If you're looking to pick up a useful skill, better your current skills or branch out into something entirely new, Brilliant has you covered with an array of lessons focusing on computer science, maths and science subjects, with tons of lessons available and new ones added monthly. So try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days with my link, which is down in the description, brilliant.org forward slash MertKK, or click the link in the description. The first 200 of you will get 20% off your Brilliant annual premium subscription. So let's get back to the video. For those of you who've not quite found themselves falling from the dizzying heights of free time into the swirling vortex of disorientation that is four-player co-op horror, I'll give you a little rundown of the genre before we start. The rest of you, feel free to skip, unless you really love my nasally teenage boy voice, in which case make yourselves as comfortable as you need to be. The premise of cooperative horror games is nothing new, Ghostbusters being a key example of full goofs sprinting around haunted houses in silly boy gear, but in game gaming especially, it's a niche that saw a rise to prominence with Phasmophobia back in 2020 during the height of the Covid pandemic when we were all looking for stuff to do together. 
As it stands, this genre will have a few static factors. A selection of maps that are unlocked via levelling your character, maps are static with no entities beyond you and the ghost, a selection of items that are used either in gathering information or defence, periods of safety and danger with death spectating, proximity chat intended to increase the sense of isolation, in-game UI that facilitates information gathering such as journals, one ghost enemy AI that is randomly allocated to each game, and each ghost type that exhibits their own relevant behaviours. The TLDR, sprinting around a dingy old school, campsite or house, pursued by an aggressive AI, with the intention either to identify said ghost, exercise it, or both. And believe me, it's exercise enough for the both of us. Get it? Section 1. Premise. We're coming in strong with our first section of the video, Premise. Here, we will cover the gameplay loop of these games in its entirety, and in as much breadth as possible. Then we'll break down what works or doesn't for each game. Let's go. Phasmophobia. The premise of Phasmophobia is deceptively simple. You are a bunch of awkwardly statured dead-eyed character models who clip eerily into one another, with hair that despawns entirely in fog, and you've been hired to try and identify the ghost haunting whichever farmhouse, abandoned school, or creepy old prison you find yourself in. The information you're given to go on will depend entirely on which difficulty you're playing on. You'll always have the equipment you've bought with you and the ghost's name, but whether they respond to anyone or just people who are by themselves, whether there is a grace period before the ghost is allowed to hunt you, whether there is a map of the location and an annotated icon for the fuse box, and whether there is a list of characters, their dead alive status and their respective sanity is entirely up to the difficulty. We'll talk more about the difficulty in the replayability section. For now, you need to use this equipment to walk into the building and, to be blunt, figure out what the fuck is going on and try very, very hard not to die in the process. But after hiring this club of professional ghost hunters, your contractor can be very, very sure that their petty cash will be well spent. Oh, I've soiled myself. If you fail to guess the ghost type correctly or do any of the side objectives, you'll finish the night with a cool $15 each, at the most, and I have to say I think $15 is a pretty fair price to have a group of strangers come to your house and incorrectly identify the spectre that is actively trying to kill you in your sleep and then leave again without doing anything. You can't argue with a rate like that. As you'll find after a quick flick through your journal, all ghosts have three different kinds of evidence each, besides the mimic type which will have a fourth red herring piece of evidence to throw you off its scent. The evidence all has to be captured in different ways, and you can only carry three items at a time, including flashlights, defensive items like crucifixes and smudge sticks, or peripheral items you can use to search for extra niche bits of ghost-specific evidence with, or more appropriately, get your dailies done with. We've got freezing temperatures, or freezy teas, which at time of writing can be detected through the use of a temperature gun, but are usually just denoted by having foggy breath when you enter the specific room the ghost is haunting. We've got ghost writing, where you leave a book on the ground and kindly and repeatedly ask the ghost to write in it, only to give up and leave after 15 minutes and discover later that the ghost should have done it, but didn't. We've got fingerprints or fingy peas, where the ghost will leave handprints on the doors, tents, or sliding prison doors that they open as they move around the area, or a delicate little fingerprint on the tip of a light switch. We have ghost orbs detected using the night vision mode on your camera, which you have to be careful with, ghost orbs are not evidence, since these are the mimic's red herring evidence, and you have to be very careful careful that the mimic has already been ruled out before you tick this evidence. We've got the spirit box, or the speebo, a kind of supernatural two-way radio that can only be used when the lights are off. You can ask questions directly to it, and if you're within a few meters of the invisible roaming and hopefully docile ghost, it will respond and scare the shit out of you. We've got the dots projector, which throws up projections of green light across the walls and ceilings wherever you place it. If a ghost walks through it, you'll see their white silhouette prance across it all quick and goofy, and finally, although the ghost Ghosts will return EMF readings in rooms that they are active in, only some ghosts are powerful enough to return an EMF level 5. So let's say you walk into a room and immediately clock Freezy Tees. You tick that off. The door swings open so you scan it with the UV light and notice Fingy Peas. Fantastic, two pieces. Now we've narrowed it down to only a few ghosts. Is it a demon, or a revenant, or something else? But like I said, some ghosts have very specific behaviours that will single them out immediately. Demons hunt every 20 seconds, they're very aggressive 
impressive. Gorios will appear on the dot's projector, but only when viewed through a camera. The Banshee will scream at you down the parabolic microphone. The Obake will have a chance to leave a six-fingered handprint on any door. Occasionally, you can find your conclusions with less than three pieces of evidence, and later difficulties will rely on your ability to do this. The main difference between playing this solo or in co-op is merely in the efficiency. In larger maps, co-op players can split up and search separately, able to flag the haunted room much faster. Four players means up to 12 items enter the site, rather than a solo person's three, so you're able to detect more evidence in one trip, versus a solo player who will need to make multiple trips back and forth from the van. This won't be an issue for a seasoned solo player, but the longer you're on site, the faster your sanity will drain, and the sooner a ghost will hunt. The more trips you're making, the less likely it is that you'll be lucky enough to make it out each time, plus it's very scary. Four players also serve as four lives, four chances. When you die, you lose everything you bought with you, so if the person who bankrolled the entire operation dies, you'll have to pull your cash together next round. And if you're playing alone, that person is you, and you're sent right back on your ass without a paycheck, because not only did you fail to identify the ghost, but you failed to live long enough to get back in the van, so what now? And that's not even accounting for the morale of a four-man squad sprinting around Camp Woodwind singing Sea Shanty 2 in perfect synchronicity. Farts my uncle used to leave were blinding. But let's rewind a little bit. People can die? Well, I mean, I don't think people would be that desperate to leave their house so that four badly dressed office workers can come in and throw salt all over the floor if these ghosts weren't dangerous. As you embark on your journey into whatever haunted bungalow takes your fancy, your sanity will drop, denoted by the screen in the van. It drops faster in the dark when seeing the ghost or when using a cursed item, which we'll cover a bit later on, and once your sanity hits a threshold, which is roughly 50% depending on the ghost, it will begin to hunt. Some ghosts will haunt, where it manifests physically and scares the shit out of you, but these aren't dangerous despite their thudding terror. <laughs> but every ghost will hunt under the right conditions. You get a grace period of a few seconds where the lights start flashing and the ghost manifests stationary and it is time to run for your life. The doors to whichever location you're in will lock, so you're trapped in there with whichever furious entity has decided to strangle you to death. Consequently, you need to make the most of the space, hiding in cupboards or lockers or crouching behind tables or bits of furniture. Crucifixes only prevent hunts, so once a hunt is in motion, there's not a lot you can do with it, though burning smudge sticks can confuse the ghost briefly, giving you a few seconds to slip behind the family hatchback or cram yourself behind a conveniently placed chair. During a hunt, ghosts roam the house, causing all the electronics to go nuts. You'll hear them speaking, sometimes they sing, sometimes you can hear them asking where you are, sometimes they're fairly quiet and their footsteps will absolutely clatter in the silence as you and your mates sit with bated breath in a locker, clipping awkwardly through the walls. Ghosts can hear you talk through the microphone, proximity chat isn't just for you, you know, so you have to stay extra quiet. Unlike like my friend who will take the opportunity to vape and whose gaseous sucking sounds bring whichever revenant is combing the halls right to his location. Do it. Hiding. Why? Because I'm scared. Once the ghosts find you, and they have 360 vision so don't try and creep behind them, they'll make a beeline for you. You won't be able to outrun them unless you have infinite sprint, which is an option but entirely disables rewards, and once they touch you, you will die. No second chances, hands close in on your face as your friends watch your character melodramatically choke to death in front of them. Watching a teammate accidentally run headfirst into a ghost that is careening towards them down the hallway of a dead asylum, and hearing their distant screams in the proximity chat cut off by a guttural choking noise, it's what I live for. There he is. <laughs> Where? Oh. <laughs> At this point, they drop all of their belongings, and if they have a single use item, you better go and grab it. The hunts are the best part of Phasmophobia and my favourite moments. When you see the front door slam and all four of you are clamouring at it in terror, rattling the handle as a woman crawls backwards towards you across the floor, screeching, heartbeats thunder in your ears, you hear the ghost getting closer and closer, and if you've not found a place to hide yet, you better hope they don't turn the corner you're squatting behind. <laughs> no, I got it. No, I don't. Oh, I'm dead. Open the door. <laughs> Open the door! <laughs> That being said, once you've found your three pieces of evidence, you circle the ghost you suspect to be haunting this abandoned farmhouse and pile into the back of the van, zooming off into the night to be greeted with your results screen and depending on conditions and challenges completed, like $45, two people died and you got $45. <laughs> <laughs> There's no god! 
I wish Big Bird did die at the challenge disaster. So, let's weigh it up. Firstly, what doesn't work so well about Phasmophobia? On the whole, the gameplay loop of Phasmophobia is really solid. It's super fun, super easy to just hop on and play a few games. The randomly generated mission template means that you never miss out on any lore or key information, you never need to catch up on anything, and the co-op aspects are clearly what the game was built around rather than vice versa, where co-op aspects have been wedged in later, making it a very seamless experience to play. So, when I mention a few of the cons that I'm about to mention, know in advance that many of my gripes about Phasmophobia will come to fruition in the replayability section of this video. So I'm just laying the groundwork for them here. If you hear me say something and you're like, oh, she's missing a detail or she's not looking at the whole picture of this right now, just bear with me, keep it in the back of your mind, I will address it later in the video. Phasmophobia has a live service template but features a very limited pool of content. Whilst Phasmophobia has a live service template, i.e. daily and weekly challenges with seasonal events, this contradicts its extremely polished gameplay loop and super straightforward mechanics. Particularly when you walk into the haunting and find the ghost waiting for you in the first room, freezy teas, ghost orbs, EMF5, let the bitch blow out a candle, trigger a motion sensor, walk in some salt and we're back out and in the van within three minutes. Once you get to a certain level of familiarity with the game, every job you embark on can become very two-dimensional. You either walk in, can't find the haunted room and all die over the course of 20 minutes, or you walk in and solve it on the spot. And it's a difficult one to balance because, for example, you can sometimes be set around for upwards of like 15 minutes waiting for your final piece of evidence to just flutter to light, manifest in front of you. So merely making evidence rarer would increase the time spent, but it would not increase the fun factor. Ghost writing books can generally be left ignored by ghosts for so long that you just assume it's not evidence. There's only so many times you can use the smudge stick, trapping the ghost in the room with you, and pick up and put the book down again several times, all the while saying, please write in the book, give us a sign, please write in the book, please write in the book, before you assume it's not going to write in the damn book. Or you're stood there for so long that your sanity dips and the ghost just manifests and rips your colon out. I suppose the simplicity of the gameplay loop is a double-edged sword. You know, it's easy to pick up and play, but as soon as you're competent at it, you're immediately too good to play it. Some of you will raise the difficulty slider as an argument here, and I will address the concept of difficulty in playability, uh, but to quickly muse on that for now, I don't adore the way the game scales difficulty in terms of evidence, and I'll get to that in a bit. Don't get me wrong, I loved the more aggressive ghosts walking in and having the door immediately slam shut behind me. I love inching through the prison in the pitch black because I didn't bring a light source while a shambling zombie screams on the floor above my head, but I didn't much generally care for it. So, what does work? This section almost feels superfluous considering how hard I've been sucking Phasmophobia off so far today, but just to tick through what makes this experience so wonderful anyway, let's make sure we're covering our bases when we talk about the good parts of Phasmophobia. The gameplay is sitting on some ironclad foundations. Firstly, the system of ghost types and their individual tells is, on the whole, so polished and so engaging. It gives you an opportunity to learn tons about what you're facing to the point where sometimes you know at a glance what you're dealing with, but this knowledge never makes a ghost less deadly and the tension continues to be overwhelming. I normally find when you learn too much about a horror entity in horror media it becomes boring, but in Phasmophobia it is just, it, it is just as fun just in a different way. I like that some of the evidence is so consistent. For example, we always hop into a hunt with me holding a night vision camera and my friend holding an EMF sensor. Every haunt has EMF readings, so as soon as we find the room with EMF feedback, we know that this is the ghost room. If I see a room with ghost orbs, we know this is the ghost room, even if ghost orbs aren't evidence. On larger maps, we carry parabolic microphones, which, while usually don't return evidence of their own, can detect noise from really far away, which helps us narrow down our search. The structure of the game is consistent with added levels of optional complexity. I like that, as you become more comfortable with the game, you can begin to dismantle the safety net that the early difficulties afford you. It feels almost ridiculous to me that we used to have a 5 minute grace period at the start of every job, or very short hunts, or the fuse box would always be on upon arrival. We've turned all that off now, which boosts our rewards, but also maintains a lot of the challenge, which is exactly what keeps us coming back. My favourite difficulty option involves toggling the frequency, duration, and inevitability of ghost hunts. I'm in this for the thrill. The hunts are my absolute favourite aspect of Phasmophobia, and being able to toggle difficulty in aspects of the game I enjoy the best means I can keep evidence fairly easy and just focus on getting the shit scared out of me, just like I want. Yes. Bye! <laughs> Whee! 
The multiplayer gives everyone a job to do, whilst giving you the space to hang out as friends. I think there's such a fine balance to strike when it comes to multiplayer games. Do you want it to be like a ranked Overwatch or Dead by Daylight session where you only have the opportunity for a quick chat in the 20 seconds it takes to queue between games together, and otherwise you're just sweating it out, concentrating on the game, only communicating to speak specifically about what you're doing? Or do you want it to be like a Borderlands co-op experience where the gameplay is more there as a backdrop to human conversation and connection, something you can do with your hands, mindless, easy, you know, it's just an excuse to hang out with your friends. I find Phasmophobia sits comfortably in the middle, simple enough that there's no exhaustion associated with it, it's not a fatiguing game, it's not a tilting game, it's one you can play indefinitely as long as you have the energy for it, but it's engaging enough that it's not entirely on your friends to conjure conversation for lengths of time. You can focus on puzzles and challenges and work together and have a good laugh, instead of getting to the three hour mark and realising you've run out of things to talk about. Especially when you're winding down after a long day at work, hopping on a game with your mates, and want company and good laughs without having the energy to get into the flow of a rich conversation. What? Yeah, I love finance. You'll clip that. <laughs> everything has its place within the game. Every item in Phasmophobia, besides maybe the standalone microphone you can just leave in the ghost room, has its place within the game. All evidence collecting items do their jobs well, with zero overlap amongst one another, meaning you can't cut corners by bringing, say, one piece of evidence collection tech instead of two. Your inventory slots will always be full, and especially when entering larger maps, you need to consider what's needed now versus what you can bring later. You could, for example, walk into a small map with no light source, just evidence collection items, plant said evidence collection items in the ghost room, and then just feel your way back out again. Eventually you get a real muscle memory for the maps. So you can walk in from minute one with dots, book, and a camera and just go watch from the van after that. But when you're dropping into Brownstone High School, you'll need a flashlight for sure so that you can get out, and maybe the parabolic microphone. It won't collect evidence, but you'll find the ghost room faster, and if it takes a while to find the ghost room, it could be good to bring a crucifix in case the ghost haunts before you're properly set up. So there's no evidence collection there, you establish yourself first, then return with the important stuff. The end game economy scales well with player ability. Despite the shop UI, which I'll get to, don't worry, the actual in game economy is a stroke of genius. So everything has a price in Phasmophobia. Items range between being like $20 and $200, you know, approximately, and your returns from a successful hunt will again range. Sometimes you'll come away with less than $10 if things go really badly, sometimes you'll get a few hundred dollars. Weekly challenges will get you 3000 but especially if you're playing solo, it's hard to scale up your selection of equipment beyond the starter stuff until you're getting better at the game. You'll be able to buy one or two things each round, and do you want to buy something new and learn how to use it and potentially have hunts become easier? Or do you buy an extra of an existing item, or focus on defensive items, or things like motion sensors for your challenges to earn more money in turn? The economy isn't fucked. You'll usually be able to buy things from the get-go, even if it's just a couple bits and pieces, and it allows you to build an understanding of the game and a familiarity with all the available kits slowly as you wean yourself into Phasmophobia. You're not overwhelmed by every single item at once, some of them are level gated so you can't access everything straight away, and it gives you an opportunity to drip feed yourself the roster of equipment until you know what you need and what you can just kind of go without if you have to. Optional objectives add some very needed gameplay diversity. Optional objectives fall a little bit under topics that we'll discuss later in the video, but to quickly just drop them here, I think they're a fantastic idea, especially for a game that is still in early access and doesn't have all of its content yet and is still receiving frequent updates. It's something to keep people coming back, it's something for them to do in the meantime. Not so much because they keep you coming back week on week, there's nothing especially engaging about a no light source weekly challenge run of Bleasdale Farmhouse, for example, but because in the event that you do ID a ghost within 18 seconds of entering one of these hell sites, you will hop back into the van and comb through your challenges. Especially when you're all in the pits of sanity, fresh out of sanity pills, running back into a haunted derelict asylum with a lit candle to see if you can get the ghost to blow it out before it appears out of nowhere and plays the xylophone on your raw, exposed, bleeding ribs, will never not be an exercise in hysteric mania, like this transcendent laughing fear, and often ends up encompassing some of my favourite moments in this game. <laughs> His last words. You've got the wrong fucking room. Now, on to Forsake. Wait, you can hide in these? Oh my, that's awful. It is, isn't I can it? I see you. What? Oh my god. 
Wow, we really did spend all that time on Phasmophobia. Of course we did. On the other end of the ghost hunting genre spectrum, we have Forsake, a game focusing more on the dessert of ghost hunting, the climax, the exorcism. Forsake features no identification stage. Either the ghost was pre-identified or, like a weathered comedian, requires no introduction. Whilst there are set map locations in Forsake, a school, a suburb, a campsite, each unlocked by completing one successful exorcism in the previous, they are procedurally generated, meaning that they have a set scale skeleton, but will change physically every time. No matter how familiar you feel with a map after combing through it, every arrival on scene provides a disorienting new experience. You never feel entirely at home. Now, how does the game play? Of all the games we're seeing today, this one is the simplest. To achieve the shuddering heights of exorcism, you need to rush around the map, exploring every available room. This is the only game where a map is not only provided, but available constantly at the touch of a button, and can be used while moving, which suits the gameplay of Force perfectly. Forsake is a very fast paced game. You spawn onto the map and you need to start scrounging around very fast, exploring every available room. When a room is searched, its text goes from white to grey, a touch I've seen done similarly in Silent Hill and Resident Evil titles, and is a system I think works really well to keep you from wasting your time. And time cannot be wasted in Forsake, as late game room rustling will be done with the ragged breath of a ghost in your ears as it jabs at your ribs with a pair of rusty scissors. Some rooms are locked behind key keys or card access, and those keys and cards might be locked behind other locked doors. So it's a process of combing the map through, grabbing what you find, then combing and combing like your mum on the night of a nitskir. Every game will come laden with a few extra objectives, finding hidden rooms, exploring a certain percentage of the given location for example, but your ultimate goal, no matter the map or ghost, will be to find three hidden relics. There will always be three, and although those three might be different per ghost, such as the clown that has the mallets, or the geisha that has three knives, they are functionally identical. It's just a case of finding three things and placing them on the provided exorcism tile, which also needs to be found. The ghost will spawn on the map shortly after you arrive, becoming smarter and more aggressive for every relic you collect. At least we assumed so. Often finding the ghost would come blundering through the front door the second we picked up this, scissors or stethoscope or hourglass or whatnot. Although we couldn't quite be sure, we observed that after enough progress, the ghost seems to always know where you are. At this point it becomes a gauntlet of just guiding them around around kitchen islands or school desks. Ghosts are like that one neighbour everyone has, extremely aggressive but slow and dumb. Ghosts seem to have a conical vision that doesn't extend especially far forwards, their field of view is quite limited so you can hide off to the side with fairly consistent results, and they can only see straight ahead, but you can quite comfortably stand far enough ahead down a corridor or in shadow that they don't notice you. Items like the EMF detector help here too, which will beep far more frequently depending on how close you are to the ghost, geographically obviously, not emotionally. Which which helps in equal parts to keep you informed, whilst also having you perched on your absolute last strand of nerves, especially in maps with multiple floors like the hospital, where the ghost will trigger the detector even if it is vertically above you. The conflicting readings will have you jumping at every shadow. And unless you're playing on the highest difficulty, the ghosts are visible at all times. They roam constantly and uninterrupted. I don't think they can teleport, although I wouldn't be surprised. So while you will have a rough idea of what to expect at any moment, you still need an extra it planned for when the ghost strides in and catches you rifling through their armoire. Once they do notice you, it's a case of either hiding or kiting. Most locations, no matter how spaghettified they are in terms of spreading out, will feature loops of some kind, some way of escaping if you can't hide, because otherwise you get cornered and bled out. You do have some defensive items if you need them, the most crucial being the glow sticks. At the start of the game, you'll be given a selection of glow sticks and can find more around the map as you explore. You can throw a glow stick to the ground, at which point the ghost, and for that matter everyone in the vicinity, will get brutally flashbanged. It's actually funny how intense the burst is. The ghost is staggered and your teammates will flail around with their eyes and nose bleeding, and in this small window you are free to skip out of the room. Some games you finish with basically every glow stick left over, some games you finish utterly running on fumes, resorting to pocket sand. If you run out of glow sticks you're pretty screwed, unless you have any spectacular duking ability, otherwise prepare to be clobbered to death. Especially in the title to maps like the slums where huge swathes of the map consist of tight winding corridors. Not much of an opportunity to give old Casper the run around here. Still, if you get to the exorcism portion of this ordeal with about 8 glow sticks left between you, you get all the payback you could ever want. There really does need to be diminishing returns on these things or a grace period where you can't stun the ghost again for a while, because being able to bully a supernatural murderous entity from beyond the grave is far too fun, far too easy and far too free. There are a bunch of 
items actually, and quite graciously, Forsake is the only game on this list that offers the chance to buy and spec into skills. Things like being able to see your teammates on the map, sharing all picked up keys and codes between the team, and surviving more hits can be bought and sold back. If you buy a skill and don't like it, you can just untick it and have your points back, which is a relief considering how long a lot of the skills take to save up for. I do believe each ghost has a somewhat different set of behaviours too, such as the little Japanese doll schoolgirl having an additional ghost, a terrifying ventriloquist dummy looking brother who will often creep up behind you and terrify you without doing any of his own damage. On most difficulties you can survive one hit before you die on the second, and on death you get a light jump scare. It's not pleasant, but it's also manageable and you get used to it very quickly. After this point you can spectate and you will still be fully audible in game on the proximity chat, which will scare the shit out of your team the first time it happens. You can revive teammates as well, which is a nice touch. Once you've got all three relics and the ritual circle lights up, it's just a case of luring the ghost over to it. They should be at their peak aggression at this point, and they will blunder right into it so hard you may as well have propped a box up on a stick. The moment they touch the exorcism circle, a cutscene will play, and they will drift into the great beyond, the circus in the sky. So let's discuss pros and cons. What could Forsake be doing a little bit better? While Forsake has a really sturdy foundation and a solid gameplay loop with a lot of promise, it's not yet got the zest needed to keep players returning. As a result, I have included a few suggestions throughout the cons I'm about to lay out for some improvements that could be made. The ghost isn't ghostly enough. The experience of being chased by these ghosts is certainly one of panic and offers a sick feeling of dread, don't get me wrong, it's close, but it's not quite there. The ghost being a tangible constant physical presence walking around in a closed set means it, in theory, could be anything and the result would be exactly the same. You could be pursued by a murderous zebra and have the same experience. I think the game would benefit by having the ghosts be much harder to see and detect, even on lower difficulties. Have periods of transparency or invisibility ability, allow them to move through walls and close doors, maybe fade in and out as they chase you, or add an overlay that gets darker as they chase you. The chases are the most intense aspect of this game, so I think it would serve to lean into that hard. Also, give the ghosts 360 degree vision, I promise it'll be so worth it. If the gameplay loop can't be unique, make sure the ghosts are. While each ghost in Forsake has a unique appearance, meaning there's no ambiguity on what exactly is chasing you, they all follow the rough same format of behaviour. They roam, they detect, they chase. The hunt is constant and it is on. Some of the ghosts do have their unique behaviours. The Grim Reaper is much quieter than the others, meaning you often don't notice him until you've run right into him. He can also send teammates packing with a single hit, teleported elsewhere on the map, isolated. The little Japanese doll girl has her weird brother, but the others? the clown, the doctor, the geisha, they either had indiscernible behaviour or all functioned identically. Fuck off you daft wench. Well, that's all sorted. I know that many of the Phasmophobia ghosts function identically between one another, but in a game where the premise involves trying to tell them apart, it helps that their behaviour and visuals are very murky, so that you don't walk in and just immediately know what you're dealing with. However, since Forsake doesn't have an identification stage, the approach to every ghost is exactly the same every time, because it doesn't matter what kind of ghost it is, and I think this causes the gameplay to go quite stale quite quickly. Since we don't need to worry about players guessing what the ghost type is, Forsake should really lean into making each one unique and operate in ways to entirely change the way the game is approached every time you load in. I think this is where the fun factor is. Make each ghost a unique brand of terror in a series of high intensity randomised maps. You could have ghosts target one player at a time, trying to whittle the team down and ignoring others, causing blindness or partial vision, deafness or hinder mobility in one or all players, interfere with your items, rendering them misleading or even useless, take the form of one of your teammates to lure you in, perhaps with a blank face, move when you're not looking at them, weeping angel style, cause hallucinations like fake relics that alert the ghost to your location. Not all items are created useful. This is a little thing, but little things deserve mention too. Some of the items in the shop are insanely useful, like the EMF reader, but some of them are pretty meh, like the crowbar, which can be used to pry away wooden beams from blocked doors. As well-intentioned as these are, the map will always provide you with a crowbar anyway, especially if something necessary is hidden behind the pride wall, so you can't get softlocked, which makes it a bit useless. 
Now, let's talk about the good stuff. Simple and solid. Although the formula of Forsake could do with a bit more depth, see 20 seconds ago, the concept of entering a scene, collecting the items required to exercise a ghost, exercising said ghost and leaving is decisive, high intensity and features tons of opportunity for action. You walk in with a job to do and you rid a location, sometimes even a small neighbourhood, of a murderous rampaging ghost or die trying. And that's honourable, we can only dream. What I appreciate about a game like this is that it is a structured one. The gameplay loop is definitive objectives are clearly dictated to you and then you rush off into the darkness on a wing and a prayer. If you've forgotten what to do or haven't played the tutorial level, like we didn't because who has time to learn when you have time to gurn, you can hop in and figure it out as you go. Forsake's template means you'll never be able to sprint through knowing exactly what you need and where it is. Coordination and forward planning is needed every time and getting lost or unnecessarily backtracking adds time and immense risk to every game. Character progression and specialization. Again, Forsake is unique on the this list and that it is the only game of the three to offer individual character progression. Although there are only four character models to choose from, all looking like extras from the Geordie Shore, you can earn XP and spec into different areas of expertise. You can have each member of your team assigned to a different build or just play around with your favourites. Not only does it help in the moment, but it gives you something to work towards beyond just levels and money. Some of the skills in Forsake require 20 levels before you can spec into them, which is going to take a really long time to achieve, but they are very worthwhile. And many of the skills really are so useful, even the low level ones. During your first few levels, when you're saving up for your first skills, you really are playing with your hands behind your back, walking into these places completely blind. Even skills that allow you to see your friends on the map helps so much when working together. The panic of getting lost and having no idea where anybody else is, is beyond stressful. The ghost is a constant threat. Unlike Phasmophobia and, as we'll discuss, Demonologist, which only features brief moments of threat amidst time spent exploring and quietly discussing ghost orbs, Forsake's ghosts are always there, always looking for you, and are always ready to disembowel. They take their jobs very seriously and will perform them to the utmost degree of quality. Consequently, once the ghost spawns, there will be no more moments of quiet in Forsake. No moments where you can relax and just have a rummage through the drawers of some quiet master bedroom. As we played, we got very, very used to whizzing through rooms at maximum speed, clearing them out with clinical precision, aware that the screaming phantom we could hear somewhere in our vicinity was closing in on our soft little cheeks, and very quickly indeed. There are even collectibles in drawers and cupboards in this game, so you really are just sweeping the place like a squad of police officers looking for a gram of weed, no stone left unturned, furniture in disarray, coming away empty handed and requesting more funding. And with the threat of a jump scare death, the stakes feel even higher. Scares equal stakes. He fucking caught us. Fuck. But turn around, but turn around. What's going to <laughs> Oh, she just did a fucking. Oh, don't raise me, I don't be back into the. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> This will definitely be down to your own personal opinion, but I like that the deaths are so intense and carry a fright of their own. Beyond the stakes of just losing progress and being sent back to the start of a level or being sent back to the lobby, I think that the best death animations are the ones that make you deeply uncomfortable, because they add another layer of stress and wanting to avoid being caught in them. Consider the bloater death animation from The Last of Us Part 1. A huge, lumbering, mushroom-laden creature comes flying over to Joel, grabs the top of his head and shoves his hand in his mouth and then literally rips his head in half. In the final few frames of the death animation we see Joel's terrified, wide open eyes. It's really, really gruesome. It's not a nice death to watch. I think deaths like this in games add to the mounting fear and discomfort. You want to avoid them. Having these monsters come careening at you beyond their physical might gets the heart pumping and the adrenaline fluttering. Forsake's jump scares aren't quite so physically uncomfortable. You know, there's no gore. It's just a little man popping up and screaming at you. But the threat of that happening at any given time occasionally had me frozen in terror. It was enough to keep me desperately scrabbling at doors and pushing forwards away from a rampaging ghost even when I was lost. I was in an absolute tizzy every time. One of the boys in my yard is bag shit in there in PE. <laughs> Demonologist.
that. Finally, game number three, Demonologist. Demonologist goes last here because it is a combination of the formula of Phasmophobia and Forsake. You identify a ghost using their three pieces of unique evidence, complete three mandatory objectives around the map, and then you exercise the ghost. For the record, I think this is fantastic. It's the perfect combination. In fact, despite Phasmophobia being my current go-to, Demonologist is the game that I think has the most potential of all three titles we've discussed here. And that's why I'm going to be the most critical of it, because potential really is the key word with Demonologist, and I was overall quite disappointed by this game. Loading Demonologist will spawn you in the lobby, someone's eerily lit flat with that weird industrial lighting that makes everything look like the inside of a fridge. I've often been told to investigate the bath in this lobby, but never saw any particular results, so I wonder if there's a random scare that can happen. I'll never check though, fuck that. The lobby looks a bit like The Room from Silent Hill 4, The Room, despite not really being laid out like that at all. Again, it's got to be the lighting. I feel like a deli chicken in here. The lobby features a good load of utility, similar to Phasmophobia and Forsake. You can customise your character with some very thorough customization options. You can customise your lobby, adding items such as radios and furniture, buy equipment for your upcoming ghost hunts, and you can all vote for the next map. The customization options in Demonologist are fantastic. Sure, you have to buy most customization options, but with such a thorough selection of options, you can be sure you will always be hunting ghosts alongside the village people. I have to say, sprinting into the abyss with three sweaty muscular men in briefs is a tone perversion, but a welcome one. Once you've finished, navigating these three screens, which as we'll discuss in the presentation section is an arduous task in and of itself, you vote for the map, ready up, and start. You begin each level in the little camp you've erected off-site, it'll be bare bones at first, and honestly, for a good while, with only one of each of the most basic possible equipment available to you. Demonologist is referred to quite often as a rip-off of Phasmophobia, which is a notion I will return to multiple times during this video, either to argue in favour of or against, but for the the purposes of efficient explanation, I will be explaining many of the base mechanics in comparison to their equivalents from Phasmophobia, as I've already described them there and how they work, so I don't need to teach you anything new. You have the EMF detector, which is a little wooden board with a trapped roach that dances when you're near a ghost, returning an EMF rating of 1 to 5. The easel, similar to the ghost writing book of Phasmophobia. We have the spirit box. We have a UV lantern. We have the ESG, which works similarly to the dots projector. We have the ectoplasma glass, which when held up up to your eye can be used to see splatterings of ectoplasm across walls and furniture, and yes, before you ask, we have already made the joke. Oh, the masturbatorium. I need to feel like I've done something wrong afterwards, so this is perfect. It's the same as mine, the single yeah. swinging exposed light bulb. Single exposed light bulb <laughs> with like a 30 year old armchair. As you walk through whichever haunted location you find using your equipment, you will collect between one and three different pieces of ghostly evidence. Fingerprints, EMF responses, ESG projections, freezing temperatures, easel drawings, spirit box responses, and ectoplasm stains. Similar to Phasmophobia, you will pull up your interface, in this case it's a tablet as opposed to Phasmophobia's journal, and tick off the pieces of evidence you collect. You can also check the ghost types for more in-depth descriptions and specifics to keep an eye out for. However, in Demonologist, you can't flick back and forth between selecting two ghosts you're on the fence about. Once you pick the ghost, you are stuck into that choice, and it's mandatory that you select a ghost type before you're allowed to continue to the next stage of the job. There are other items for purchase, crucifixes, video cameras, candles, sanity pills and thermometers for example, but to tell it to you now, early and honestly, I was not able to afford much extra equipment beyond a candle after several hours of playing, so I can't even tell you what they're like to use. We'll get to this later. Peppered with jump scares, Demonologist is quite insistent on delivering delivering relentless action. Sometimes this really works and sometimes it really doesn't, but for better or worse, it is there. Some jump scares are quite common, such as ghosts popping out of things and screaming at you. Some of them have to be triggered by the player, such as speaking the name of a portrait into said portrait, at which point the inhabitant will come flying out of it. Others are random, like a ghost appearing right in front of you and making the loudest noise known to man. All the while, you and your poor beleaguered friends will be trying to identify this ghost. Once you think you've got it, you unlock the challenges stage. These are are additional challenges, the name implies they're optional, but they are very much not. Some of these require items you need to buy and will not be provided, such as candles. Others will be challenges you can complete as you're gunning it around the house, grabbing dead rats, finding silhouettes in chairs, catching ghost orbs. Once all of these challenges are complete, you unlock the exorcism stage. Every separate map will have a unique exorcism. The exorcism will always be the same for each map, but each
each map is different. For example, in the first house, the first map you access, you have to collect five fingers from around the house, which need to be dropped in little pots in the basement and burned. At time of writing, I've only correctly identified and exercised a ghost twice, and I died during one of those attempts as well, so I've only been able to buy one candle and one crucifix, and I have unlocked none of the available maps. The exorcism is always the same per map, and in the case of the house, which is the only map I have unlocked, you need to go around the house, find five fingers, and burn them in the basement, so, you know, I'm pretty used to that now. It doesn't really branch out in this stage beyond giving you one final gauntlet to complete, typically at 0% sanity, which is exciting, but samey. During your stay at the house, ghosts can begin to hunt. Ghosts in Demonologist get extremely angry if you use their name. Some of them get upset by particular language, as they are able to hear proximity chat or discord chat, if that's what you're using. So you have to be careful not to start saying their name a bunch, as it will probably trigger an early hunt. In fact, although I was warned that ghosts begin hunting at 0% sanity, I definitely had a few times when ghosts would hunt at like 70% sanity for some reason, and I've never figured out why. Ghost hunts in Demonologist are are, in comparison to the raging jump scares, far more subtle than you'd assume, and often we'd be caught entirely unaware by a ghost jogging into the room we were all stood in, swiftly ending our lives on the spot. Sometimes a ghost will warn you that it's going to hunt and will start counting down from 10. Usually, you can get out in that time, but not always. Once you're all done and you're free to leave at any time, you'll all run back to the car. You heap yourselves in and zoom back to the lobby, at which point you are presented with your final results screen, with appropriate experience and money. If you fail to identify the ghost properly, you get zero money and zero experience. Although if you've managed to do some objectives, you might get like three experience. An exorcism might earn you $400, which is half a candle. Being that gaining levels on this game requires something like 100 experience, you're only going to really see success if you begin identifying ghosts correctly without dying. Now, what's so bad about Demonologist? Ghost hunting is so inconsistent that it is more frustrating than it is rewarding. While Demonologist attempts a much more intense ghost hunting experience than Phasmophobia, it marred this with an absolutely glacial evidence collection pace. Ghosts take a long time to show actual tickable evidence in Demonologist. Even if it's manifesting in front of you, screaming in your face, things are flying around, jump scares are happening left and right, it's almost comical to have a phantom launch itself out of a portrait and scream directly in your face, or watch floating doll heads manifest, chase you, only to explode and hear a ghost tell you to fuck off, only to walk out of the house and be scratching your head with a list of unticked evidence types. The EMF detector very very rarely reaches a level 5 reading, fingerprints spawn very rarely, I've only seen a ghost use an easel twice, and I've never ever seen a ghost use an ESG. Freezing temperatures are luckily very obvious, for obvious reasons, and ectoplasm stains are easy to find when you're in the correct room, but often you'll be stood in the house for the better part of 10-15 minutes trying to get it to mess with a light switch or a door handle, or just staring at the ESG projector to see if the one second projection manifests. If the game provided a single camera from the start, you could at least set that up and observe from camp, but there is no camera in the base kit, meaning you're often stumbling around in the dark, begging for something to manifest for so long that the ghost eventually just hunts. There's no option to keep the sanity high, so it was rare we survived long enough to get three pieces of evidence. Plus, standing in a room while visions manifest and scream in your ears, keeping you tense, whilst watching your mates talk into a spirit box or place and replace the easel, or wander aimlessly with a UV light, creates a strange strange feeling where you're simultaneously high tension and bored. So we all just got really irritated with each other in a way I've not had with another game. There are too many ghost types without distinct behaviour. Similar to Phasmophobia, Demonologist has a huge list of ghost types with explanations on how they operate, and while I think Demonologist has spanned out and done a lot of its own things, this selection of ghosts is the only thing I would consider to be truly ripped off from Phasmophobia. So you've got your list of ghosts, and clicking into them will show a description and their evidence. Now, semantically, I take issue with there being demon and then several different kinds of demon. That's like having cheese and then separately brie, camembert, and cheddar. But I suppose we could have that argument about spirit. Anyway, in Phasmophobia, all ghosts have a description and some manner of distinct behaviour. That's not the case in Demonologist, where you'll go to check a ghost description and find that they simply do not yet have a coded, programmed manner of distinct 
behaviour. I think that all ghosts that don't have distinct behaviour should be removed until they've had their distinct behaviour programmed in. Especially since you get penalised so hard for not being able to tell between two ghost types and often you spend a lot of time waiting for that third piece of evidence to crop up so it kind of takes the piss that they haven't even finished building the ghost's behaviour yet. I think this would remove bloat while addressing the game's glacial pace at providing evidence. A smaller selection to narrow down through might prevent that extra 15 minutes of waiting for a ghost to use an easel, especially when their distinct behaviour might be a giveaway. In fact, all ghost behaviour just seems to be pulled from a hat at any one time. When you spawn in Phasmophobia, there is one ghost in one room with one form and one voice. When you spawn in Demonologist, you are assaulted by a series of ghosts of all ages, genders, voices, forms. You can be screamed at by a womanly voice, but when the ghost spawns it will be a hulking demon with a hulking demon voice. Are all the ghosts that come flying out of the portrait ghosts too? Are they one ghost? You can hear ten different voices and see ten different ghosts before you finally get the evidence you need. Are those ghosts just okay? Or are they not in the contract? It's ridiculous and it adds a feeling of inconsistency. Jump scares teeter on the verge of exhausting. Speaking of ten different voices with ten different forms, scares and hunts, it's it's an unusual choice to have such a slow game utterly crammed full of jump scares. It's ludicrous. I feel like the intention is for every hunt to be non-stop action. A jump scare in every room, voices shouting from the shadows, visual hallucination. The game is desperate for every job to feel like the scariest one, but this means that the limited number of jump scares and voice lines are laid bare far too quickly and no job is whatsoever memorable in the end. I found that these mechanics were at odds with the core focus of the game. In Forsake, for example, the jumpy horror works really well, the title is inherently high tension, so even small jumps will freak you out considering you are waiting for something to come flying through the door of whatever you're hiding in. In Demonologist, as with Phasmophobia, you're not rushing through a level with one goal, punctuated by fright, you are carefully walking through an enclosed space with a fucking notebook looking for clues, you know? There's a lot of mental focus required and that sits very firm at odds with the constant deluge of exhausting jump scares and loud noises. It dissuades you from exploration because you are punished for looking too closely at things, spending a moment too long, not entirely efficiently on target, and it kind of even dissuades you from coordinating a lot. I remember we ended up whispering quite a bit because sometimes you will say something in front of a portrait and the quite weird voice commands will think that you've said the name of the portrait subject into the portrait and you'll just get something come screaming out of the portrait at you, you know? Everything is jump scares in Demonologist until you're just bored of it. And the jump scares that aren't boring are the ones with the terrible volume mixing. So many of them have absolute bass boosted max volume noises that shit you up so hard. Oh, oh I don't know. the same thing from yesterday. <laughs> oh, my nutsack. The noise that that ghost made was ridiculous, and I guarantee it would have been more scary than funny if it wasn't 700 times the game's volume. Sure, sometimes moments in Phasmophobia make you jump, but the jump scares in that game are an incidental collision of mechanics. A ghost will haunt in the same room as you, you will happen to be in front of them, they will manifest physically but harmlessly, and it will happen to scare the shit out of you. This is just ah! There's no accompanying noise spike to tell you that you need to be scared now, it's just a jump scare that ends up thrilling you, making you laugh with relief. You stumble out of the house feeling foolish for being caught by an accidental combination of the in-game mechanics and your own positioning, rather than feeling irritated by the game's insistence on always scaring you. It's a genuine fright, but a fun one. Demonologist is so worried that you won't be creeped out that it works too hard and burns you out after less than an hour of playtime. The game is not made with chasers in mind. Plus, ironically, when a ghost actually starts hunting, it's weirdly subtle. Often you have no idea that a ghost has started a hunt until it has come flying into the room, rooms which have no hiding spaces, you can't even crouch so it's impossible to hide behind furniture, rooms don't typically loop on each other either so there is nowhere to run. So you end up desensitised to noise by the constant activity in the house, then when it's actually time for danger you just get wiped out by a ghost that has decided now to start tiptoeing around.
around. Demonologist is too reluctant to let you grow. The game's reluctance to properly equip you for chases starts at the roots, the pool of available items and maps and lack thereof. When you begin the game you have the most basic possible set of evidence collection plus one single map, the house, and you will have these and only these for a long, long time, easily several hours. Maybe the intention of giving you a tiny pool of items and an utter incapability of collecting any more at any speed is intended to force you to learn and master what you have before you're allowed to branch out and try something new, but honestly, everyone will want to approach ghost hunting differently. Some people like to dabble until they find what they want to go in with first and then come back for later. Especially in teams, it helps for people to run alongside the main team with defensive items or like daily related items so that once you find the haunted room you can settle down and try to make it safe before collective sanity dips too low. Especially when you're with a team, sometimes a fourth person will carry defensive items so that once you've found the room you can quickly lock it down and make it safe before the collective sanity dips too low. You know, teams get into a rhythm and people find roles within the team. Rather than assisting you in learning the ropes, I felt like the limited gear and one map for the first five-ish hours of playtime utterly kneecapped my learning and my fun. Not being able to buy anything of use after a successful hunt is ridiculous, and having these obscenely inflated numbers when we could dial everything down by a multiple of 10 and have the same result would keep things from looking so stupidly expensive. Why is a radio $6,000? Equipment needs to either be cheaper, since it can be lost, or keep it at the current expense but don't allow it to be lost on death, because it's a fucking pain to be honest with you. Furthermore, give your players dribs and drabs of cash and experience between games even if they lose. Progress isn't linear and it can be slow, and there's nothing like punishing players for hours at a time, especially their first few hours, by constantly making them return to the lobby no matter how much they've learned. When you think about it, people are going to be doing most of their learning in the first few hours as well, so to go in, feel like you've learned something and just get sent back on your ass is really demotivating. This was one of the biggest bottlenecks we had to actually feeling invested in the game. The in-game economy is absolutely shagged. If you fail to ID a ghost properly, you earn nothing. There's absolutely no growth whatsoever without explicit success in a game where the ghost's activities are not especially well telegraphed or consistently displayed. And then you'll earn about $900, which seems like a lot, but no. Everything in Demonologist costs upwards of $1,000. Some things cost $6,000, like furniture for the lobby. Cosmetic items can be outrageously expensive too. I initially assumed things like video cameras cost $1,600, i.e. two completely successful hunts, because once you buy them, you own them forever. But no. If you use the proceedings from two successful hunts to buy a video camera and then die, it's gone forever. Which adds more risk than reward to any ghost hunt, when a single death can mean you need to successfully ID a ghost approximately 10 times before you can buy back your basics, your sanity pills, defensive items, cameras, etc. Right, so. What did Demonologist actually do well? Well, the game is the best looking of all three. Contrary to Phasmophobia and Forsake, who have very clearly been put together mechanically first and visually second, Demonologist is a gorgeous game. The house looks spectacular, the lighting is immersive and realistic, the shadows, the textures. The house map, for example, also contains some routes that are blocked off, which might mean that they develop the maps as they go and potentially add medium and large versions of the smaller maps for different challenges. Until you actually start seeing ghosts, at which point it all gets a bit janky, the game looks brilliant. I have some major issues with the UI, which I will get to, but for now the visuals of this game are top of the range, and I do think that's pretty promising. The skeleton of the game has the most potential. Phasmophobia is about identification, Forsake is about exorcism. Demonologist combines the two, forcing you to see a complete timeline of ghostly happenings and really keep up the momentum throughout an entire job. It's cool. It means that no matter how quickly you ID a ghost, you are always is going to have to spend extra time there, which adds risk. The way these stages fit together is cohesive, although I personally would have put the objectives alongside both stages, and they're also called optional objectives when they're definitely not optional, they're mandatory. I don't mind really long games even if I die. I don't expect to nor want to come back from a hunt alive every single time. I love the thrilling chases very much, like just flesh it out a bit, you know, refine it, make it work a bit better. While Phasmo and Forsake have half the ideas of demonology,
demonologist each, they look half as good too. If demonologist was to actually refine its ideas in hand with its stellar visuals and more abundant premise, it would be head and shoulders above the competition, but it isn't. Section 2. Presentation Run, run. <laughs> Start again. Welcome to the second section of today's video, presentation. Now, this section is going to be quite more segmented, a little bit more quickfire. For each game, we are going to judge the presentation based on the following factors. General graphics and atmosphere, lobby, characters and customization, shopping UI, ghost and gameplay explanations, finding what you're looking for whilst in the game, maps, marketing materials, proximity and death chat, and items, usage and explanations. So let's dig in, I guess. Presentation in Phasmophobia. Number one, general graphics and atmosphere. Phasmophobia's graphics are very average, but with room for updates and improvements as time goes on. Since the game is in alpha, it's very easy to consider each house's icy smooth facade as a placeholder to be replaced with something better at a later time. Most of the atmosphere is subsidized with heavy lighting effects, thick darkness, good use of shadow, etc. The cold blanket of an overhead light on a silent empty room, thuds in the rooms above while you sit and shake in the basement, the distant sound of creaking prison cells, it's very easy to get lost in phasmophobia, despite the graphics. The Sunny Meadows Asylum basement is a whole new level of terror. Every time we're down there I can hear the panic in my friends' voices. I definitely feel like we're not welcome. Next, the lobby. The lobby in phasmophobia is very sweet. A little physical warehouse with the van, collectibles from your exploits, some games to play, a wall of your most recent photos, a radio, the shop, physically and on the PC, and the board, where you can pick your map and set up your next game. Non-customizable, nothing especially special, but an easy little place to be. Characters and customization. At time of writing, proper character models aren't due for another two major updates, not another year, so I am going to judge them as they are for now, but with the awareness that what I say will be irrelevant eventually. The characters are one of the weakest aspects of phasmophobia, particularly in breaking immersion. There's nothing like looking over at your friend during a hunt and seeing they're completely bent backwards at the spine spinning in circles. And I know it does sound scary, but I promise it's only going to make you giggle so hard that the ghost hears you and comes down in you like a sack of shit. In the lobby, you can change your character model by clicking their photo ID, taking you through a selection of glassy-eyed young adults in various versions of the outfit you might wear to paint the house. Next, the shopping UI. The shopping UI of Phasmophobia is so bad that it's a meme, and perhaps even funnier, it was recently updated to be more user-friendly, only to accidentally be somehow even worse. It's a fond joke. It takes a few goes to figure out what on earth you need to do with it, and you never really have the hang of it, and the developers have already said that they're going to fix it again, so it clearly went down universally well. I mean, if you select a bunch of items and then buy them, and then think, oh wait, I need a candle, you have to bin your previous cart, or when you select the candle and click buy, you'll just rebuy everything again by accident. Ghosts and gameplay explanations. Far more important than any characters or shopping UI are the ghost models and animations, which are the lifeblood of the game's actual horror, so it's very important that these bad boys are creepy. And you'll be glad to know that they are. There are a bunch of different ghost designs, man with two sides, huge butcher man, wailing woman in pyjamas, Omrio looking lass who walks backwards on her hands, child, etc. But they're all highly detailed and extremely creepy. Their animations are a little bit silly, but it's rare you'll stop to examine the way they jive in the corner of the haunted second floor master bathroom as you're running for your life. Finding what you're looking for while you're in a game. During play, you'll have a journal that can be brought up with the letter J. Here, you have an overview of the session, the ghost's name, who it responds to, where you are, etc. You have a selection of the photographs taken taken during your stay and their star rating, you have a list of every single ghost which can be clicked on to see more relevant information, and you have a list of evidence that can be ticked to eliminate ghosts from the pool. Personally, I do wish you could click a ghost name for more information on the same page that you see the evidence, so you're not having to memorise the names of the four remaining ghosts, clicking over to that page, reading each of them individually, then clicking back. If you could click the ghost on the evidence page and see information about them, that would be sweet. It would save a lot of needless clicking back and forth. Maps. The only maps in this game will be found in the van during a mission. Every level will have a map and this will be either a simple black and white blueprint or in the case that it's an especially busy level it will be a top-down screenshot with notable points outlined to differentiate between buildings and rooms and whatnot. On most difficulties you will be able to see the fuse box too but often this is used just for the sake of watching your terrified friends go sprinting into the basement when you've thrown the haunted music box in through the front door like a grenade triggering a cursed hunt. Eh, likely story. 
Yeah, fucking likely story. Marketing materials. Phasmophobia markets itself pretty consistently on its own content. Any marketing materials, trailers, teasers, etc. are usually abundant with unedited raw screenshots of the game. Most headers and logos are just in-game screenshots with the consistent Phasmophobia logo on them. And the subtitles and subheader fonts are this nice serif font. Love a serif font. There's clearly been a lot of effort into making these marketing materials consistent and high quality, with a vision for how the game will go. Keeping the logo simple now means it will more easily suit any future marketing marketing material updates. Plus, their website is this adorable little robe based HTML thing, I love it. Proximity chat and death chat. The proximity chat works pretty well overall, except in larger maps where you can occasionally hear the voices of your team flickering in and out, even if they're on the other side of the map, prompting you to use the walkie talkie to ask them if they're making that noise, to which they reply, oh yeah, proximity chat must be bugging again, to which you say, oh I hate when it does that, every single time. Proximity chat considers every break between a room or space to be a different room, so if you're stood on the stairs and your friend is two feet away at the top of the stairs, the proximity chat will muffle them as though you're hearing them through a wall. So there's clearly some jank to iron out, but it does help to figure out whether you're in the same room or not for certain items to be used, where they need to be used by themselves. When you die, you can freely spectate by sprinting around and you're welcome to chatter amongst yourselves and the other dead. The living players can't hear you, but you can hear them. It would also be really nice if you could scream at them down the parabolic mic or something, you know, just keep them on their toes a little bit. Items, usage and explanations. I think most of the items in Phasmophobia are as self-explanatory as they can be, considering they are items that are used specifically for the sake of ghost hunting. Although I started playing with a friend who played a few more hours than me, so he was happy to take me through the basics rather than let me figure it out alone, so I can't speak for a blank slate. I think the difference between E, F, G and right click can sometimes be confusing. All items are picked up with E, items can be placed with F but thrown with G, which can be confusing in the case of, for example, crucifixes, which need to be on the floor, but their effects won't take hold unless they are placed with F. Throwing a crucifix on the floor will do nothing, despite having a functionally identical result. Some items are used with right click, some are used with F, so it's easy to forget what you are doing. I think a slightly more refined control scheme would just eliminate all doubt of function in a game where these items are hardly commonplace, so you can't always assume what their function is going to be. Next, let's move on to the presentation of Forsake. General graphics and atmosphere. As with Phasmophobia, Forsake's graphics are a little bit more on the average side, but again are complemented enough by extreme lighting effects that it still serves to set a distinctly tense atmosphere. If we discount the constant jump scares and noises of demonologists, Forsake is the loudest game on the list. It has tons of ambient noise, distant screams, and to let you know how close you are to the entity, the ghost will make tons of sound as it bumbles around the map. But unlike the jump scares and noises of demonologists, Forsake takes you by the throat and strangles you over the course of a game. The moment the ghost spawns, tension is immediately high, and if you get used to the tension, you put the difficulty up. Even on medium difficulty, you will be feeling the stress of less available glow sticks and an angrier, clingier ghost hunting you down to the corners of the earth. Next, the lobby. The lobby of Forsake takes inspiration directly from Dead by Daylight. In fact, a lot of this game takes inspiration directly from Dead by Daylight, with four survivors sat around a fire with a looming ghost observing from the corner and invisible to all but you, the player. I was a a little bit torn on this format at first, thinking, wow, they're taking the format without really doing it properly. The killers you see in the corner of your own Dead by Daylight lobby will be the killer you last played. In this, the ghost is just random, but the more I dwelled on this thought, the more I didn't really see an issue with it. I guess any ghost can be there, it doesn't really matter. Characters and customization. There's no customization for your characters in Forsake, you can choose from a small collection of maybe four total, so it's hard not to have duplicates when there's a full team of four, and there's no indication of who's who. Despite the lack of variety, I really I really adored these character models, the bald dude in the bright shirt and chain especially, looking like he's arrived here after boarding the wrong plane with his Magaluf suitcases just propped up outside the door. There's little else more fun than watching your friend panic and go sprinting away from a freshly arrived ghost behind the facade of a man who looks like he eats limestone for breakfast. The shopping UI. The shopping UI of Forsake is the best of all three games here, and to be frank, that's not an especially difficult achievement when we compare it to either one. The shopping UI is serviceable in Forsake, it clearly demonstrates 
the item name, its price, and a small description. You can buy things with no issues whatsoever. The bar is literally so low. Ghosts and gameplay expectations. The ghost types of Forsake, similarly to Phasmophobia, are some of the best aspects of the game visually. We encountered a mad clown, a butcher, the Grim Reaper himself, a pair of scary Japanese school kids, a geisha, and a mad doctor. All of them looked brilliant. The school kids were the best, being that their two places at once power meant that they were always sneaking up on us, taking us unawares and scaring the shit out of us. That little one can sprint and he will do so out of every single shadow. Although there is an optional tutorial level, gameplay is simple and requires no real explanation. Besides, there are objectives if you get stuck and everything can be found with exploration. Usable items glow too, so as long as you are picking up everything that glows, you can bet you're going in the right direction. The health bar is a little bit superfluous, being that you can only take two hits before you die. The first hit injures you and the second hit kills you, so it's probably more worthwhile to have three character states, healthy, injured, and dead, instead of relying on a health bar, which is either at 100%, 50%, or zero, you could use blood splatters around the edges of the screen and have the characters stagger or breathe more heavily. Finding what you're looking for while you're in the game. Again, this is super obvious in Forsake and never needs explanation, and after one run you will always know what's expected of you on any map, you just don't know how to do it. Especially being that the relics needed for the exorcism are unique items, you know if you find a glowing stethoscope or clown mallet that you are likely about to pick up something very important. Maps. Forsake has the most thorough and refined map system of all three games, although that being said, I think it is the only game that needs such an accessible and detailed map. While Phasmophobia's map is only in the van, and Demonologist doesn't even have a map if I remember correctly, spoilers, their levels are contained, consistent, and there will only ever be one important room. A few playthroughs of the same level will have you familiar enough with it to navigate it without a thought, knowing the rough locations of hiding places, and once you've found the ghost room you'll never need to go elsewhere unless for dailies, hiding from the ghost, or spreading mischief. In Forsake you are constantly moving, often running directly from something that wants to kill you. Maps are large, easily with 20 plus rooms, and need to be explored extremely thoroughly from head to toe. It is really important that you know which rooms still have undiscovered items, so Forsake implements a map mechanic that harkens back to the Silent Hill and Resident Evil series where fully explored rooms will grey out. You can still see them while navigating, but you know that your exploration needs to be focused elsewhere. This keeps the game moving very quickly, it helps you sort through the rubble without spending an extra 30 minutes trying to clear a room that's long since been wiped clean, and helps you navigate while a ghost is breathing down your neck. That being said, you run by holding shift and you open the map with tab. Astute Steam users will know that using shift and tab while playing a game through Steam opens Steam, so we would open Steam by accident a lot. Marketing materials. I think Forsake's biggest attraction is its extremely weak presentation, even starting with the name. Forsake sounds like you're stuttering through for God's sake or for fuck's sake. The syllables of the word are like directionally opposing, for sake. It's a hard word to say properly and quickly, it's not like a definitive noun. The sounds for and sake are really weak when they're combined, you know what I mean? What's more is that the title for this game is unclear, uninteresting, and doesn't explain what on earth is going on. Phasmophobia implies ghosts and fear, demonologist implies the study of demons, forsake implies abandoned, which is somewhat true, but I think we can do better. Urban exorcists? Post your best ideas for an urban exploration themed exorcism game in the comments below. The banner for Forsake is the coolest part of the marketing, and the logo is pretty distinctive beyond being very similar to the Resident Evil title logo, and the heavy use of screenshots and actual gameplay in the marketing is all good. But I think the title is the real clincher and should be better considered than just being a random depressing sounding verb, because I think this game is a lot of fun and no one is finding it. Proximity chat and death chat. Of all three games, Forsake has the weakest proximity chat. Often we'd find out that our chat was cutting out, we weren't being heard very well. I think the noise suppressor is a bit too sensitive, so it was easy for our words to just get entirely blocked out. And since we found out that you can still speak in proximity chat when you're dead and be heard by the entire living team, we decided to just switch to Discord, which eliminates all the issues, so it's clear that Forsake's chat could do with a bit of a tune-up. Items, usage, and explanations. Again, Forsake has a weakness here compared to the other two, being that the game is not very clearly written. The English is unclear, grammar is weird, things are named in ways that don't entirely make sense, rules and expectations aren't framed very well. I know that this is an indie game, but fake it till you make it, you know? Deliver the highest quality, proofwritten flavour text you can, even if this isn't going to be amended as it goes. Once you get past that, the game is very clear. It delivers concise and useful tips in the loading screens, items are obvious in their use and very easy to use, the tutorial is available if you need a careful introduction, and like I said, you'll easily figure this out within a game if you forget how it all works. Finally, the presentation of Demonologist. General graphics and atmosphere. Demonologist is the best 
looking game of the three we're examining today. The map graphics are pristine, although quality does stutter when the ghosts and various other moving entities get involved. You look up after getting out of the car to see a cloudy dark night and a house bathed in sickly moonlight. You enter a shadowy lobby, kicking up plumes of dust off the carpet, creeping through tight doorways and looking out across rooms drenched in thick shadow. And then a werewolf doing the disco fever dance comes twitching over to you and all the immersion is gone. The atmosphere definitely could be the most terrifying of the three games discussed today, but the jump scares, especially with their inability to balance the volume, disrupts the atmosphere and becomes exhausting. I think the subtler animations work and don't need a loud noise sting, the girl peeking over the couch in front of the house who quickly ducks her head down, the ghost girl getting her neck snapped in the basement, the distant shadows, they don't need sound, like I can see them and I'm scared. Having something pop up in my face and go boo with their arms out wide startles me, yeah, but when it comes to real fear, my recommendations are going to align with phasmophobia, and when it comes to real tension, I'm going to be suggesting for sake. I mean, Demonologist is still in early access, so there's hope, but the team has a penchant for not ever updating the games that they put out, so there is less hope. The lobby. The lobby is very nice, very clean, lots to look at, most of it superfluous. You can buy other lobbies like pubs and whatnot, but often you'll be here to look at the three screens, pick your loadout and go. There's no basketball or hacky sack like in Phasmophobia, at least none you can get for free, so most of this is just icing on a fairly dry cake. The screens are abysmally annoying to use. As with Phasmophobia, pressing space will immediately place you in the centre menu, but unlike Phasmo, you can't navigate left and right to the other screens. I got into a confused rhythm of trying to press space on the other screens to open them while facing them, but always being forced into the main screen. Turns out you access the main screen with space, but to access the other screens you have to go over to them and manually press E on them, and then they have this weird blur texture, especially when you're scrolling, that really bothers me, it's really hard to read. And you have to vote on your map, even if you only have one unlocked. I wasn't super impressed with this lobby, despite how pretty it is. Characters and customization. Demonologist features the best character customization of all three games, hands down, allowing you to select your body type and then customize your character from head to toe however you want. Whatever bizarro hair colour or style you want, however many or few clothes you'd like to wear, whatever accessories. Naturally, it means you spend the play session with three of God's most flamboyant sweaty gays, who will make fun of you because the turtleneck sweater you put your character in has super defined tits, but it was $200 so you're wearing it whether they like it or not. The shopping UI. The UI in this game is a nightmare I never fully understood, especially when combined with that silly blur visual effect whenever you scroll. The main issue is, as I mentioned before, the sheer amount of muscle memory confusion between the functionality of the spacebar and E key when even opening a screen. From this, it's hard to know what you have in your loadout versus what you're buying, and whether or not you've managed to add something to your loadout after buying it. It took me three different hunts to figure out I'd not properly added the candle to my loadout before starting. Bastard game. Ghosts and gameplay explanations. The ghost and gameplay explanations are very weak aspects of the game, and considering they're supposed to be the explanation through which the core mechanics of the game are explained, it's really irritating that they are so bare bones. I mentioned it before, but most of the ghosts don't have their own behaviour, rendering most of their entries absolutely useless. When you can't get that final piece of evidence and you're trying to figure out what more clues you could use to get a better idea, clicking on a ghost name and seeing that they have no coded identifiable behaviour is really annoying. They don't have unique behaviour in Phasmo because it's cool and trendy, demonologist. They have it because it helps you differentiate through subtle clues that reward you for replaying and learning the game. Also, the ghosts in demonologist sometimes talk to you and it's very cringe. Finding what you're looking for while you're in a game. So the game tells you that you can open the tablet with J, which you can't, so it must have been patched out. Instead, you open open the tablet with tab, fair enough, and then click evidence. You tick freezing temperatures and EMF level 5 and see there are a few options for the ghosts that it could be. So you click back, then you click ghosts, then you realise you forgot which ghosts you needed to check, so you click back, then you click evidence, then you repeat the four or five ghost names aloud a few times to yourself so that you remember, and then you click back and then you click ghosts again, you check through the first three ghosts, no notable evidence, then you realise you forgot the last one you needed to check, rinse and repeat. Apart from the ghost types, this is the only interface I would consider to have ripped from Phasmo, and unfortunately it ripped it in a way that preserved what was so annoying about Phasmo, adding clicks as you now need to click back out and re-enter pages rather than clicking back and forth between them. Also, web design irritation 101, but they really need to get their H1s, H2s, H3s, paragraph text, etc. in order, because using full capital serif gothic text for all text is wankery, pure and simple, takes the piss. Maps. Yes. Marketing 
marketing materials. Demonologist has some really strong artistic merit, especially in its marketing materials and trophy icons. They clearly got some filthy good artists for this, as exemplified by all the brilliant gothic art, the maps, the concept art. They're all snazzy as fuck. They definitely heightened my expectations for a game that did not satisfy them. Proximity chat and death chat. The proximity chat works pretty well in Demonologist. I had no issues at all. My only gripe was with the death chat. All living members of the team can hear dead members and vice versa. I don't think that should happen, especially since dead members can traverse the house while the ghost is haunting and scan items for challenges or tell you where the ghost is haunting from. It's a temptation I will not resist, you merely just have to fix it. Items, usage and explanations. The demonologist team have gone for a distinctly Victorian vibe for all this ghost hunting kit, which is fine by me, but adds another layer of having to learn how they work, which comes with its own struggle. When we consider the EMF reader between Phasmophobia, Forsake and Demonologist, the first two have it as an item that looks like a remote control. It's fairly self-explanatory that the reading on the remote is read in from wherever it is pointing. It's very simply designed. You are aware that the only important reading is the lights and their relevant number reading. The EMF reader in Demonologist is a tray with a cockroach on it, and it's not readily apparent what the important reading of this is, nor what it responds to, whether the cockroach just gets funky sometimes, whether it responds to sound, or whether it's something you're pointing at. The EMF reader in the other game will have five lights on it. When all five lights are lit up, you can assume that that's the maximum reading. Whereas the EMF reader in Demonologist has a numerical display, what's the highest it goes to? We don't know. This is just an example, but we were pretty perplexed on what to do with items like the ESG, which just needs to be left in a room and will display illusions above it on occasion, or the easel, which apparently needs to be left alone, but would work if we were in the room or not, so what about that? And the spirit box, which has a very strict set of questions it will deliver responses to. We definitely found ourselves feeling more lost playing Demonologist than any other title looked at today. Section 3. Replayability. Replaying Phasmophobia. The biggest factor of replayability in Phasmophobia, as with many games, involves the implementation of difficulty modes, weekly challenges, daily challenges, and in-mission challenges, and a newly added challenge mode which serves out one big challenge every week with the promise of fat rewards. There are also seasonal challenges, such as the Easter Egg Challenge which asks you to scour a select number of maps, picking up all the foiled Easter eggs you could find until a random ghost lady shrieks to signify that you'd collected them all, and makes you shit your pants in the process. I've not been playing long enough to know if there are Halloween and Christmas challenges, but if they've bothered to provide an Easter mode, I would be very surprised if other holidays weren't accounted for, unless the devs just really love Easter, in which case please add a seasonal Easter bunny themed ghost that maybe resembles Frank the Bunny from Donnie Darko. I love that film. Challenges are very straightforward. Have ghosts step in salt a certain amount of times, have ghosts trigger motion sensors, have them blow out candles, successfully guess ghosts a certain amount of times for example. You win hefty amounts of money and XP for achieving those, although at time of writing there are no actual rewards beyond just having the resources to buy more gear to do more hunts, so the cycle is closed if unrewarding. The biggest reason to keep coming back will be the higher difficulties. Higher difficulties branch out in two ways. Ghost aggression, ghosts will hunt more frequently for longer, and the threshold before a ghost will hunt will lower, meaning they hunt early. And ghost evidence. The higher the difficulty, the less evidence there will be available. This means that you will need to collect, say, one piece of evidence, narrow down the ghost as best as you can, and then use the ghost's unique behaviour to guess which one it is. Sometimes you'll have a ghost like a revenant, which will walk very slowly, unless it sees someone it can kill, at which point it will sprint at you at maximum speed, often taking you completely unaware. That's a really easy one, you can tell that one at a glance. Wraiths won't step in salt, that's another really easy one. Other times you'll encounter an Onryo, who won't hunt while a candle is lit, meaning you need to stand with a lit candle in the ghost room after your sanity drops below the safe threshold to see if it doesn't hunt, and if it blows the candle out, it might immediately hunt and kill you. Demons, for example, hunt every 20 seconds, and if you use the smudge stick on them, they won't wait long before hunting again, compared to the shade, which has to wait an extra long before it can hunt, maybe like 90 seconds. The mare is functionally similar to the spirit, except just more active in the dark, but what if you get a spirit that's just especially active? All ghosts interfere with electronics when they hunt, but the Raiju interferes with electronics 15 metres away, compared to the 10 metre range of other ghosts. The Ure will only use its ability if you're in a room with two doors. It will close a door fully, affecting the sanity of any player within range significantly, but how do you tell if you can't see the sanity if you're on a higher difficulty? 
What doesn't work? I think that at time of writing, some ghosts do need more distinctive tells for this less evidence difficulty to be more fun. At present, the jump between three pieces of evidence and two pieces of evidence is like a level of sweaty dedication I struggle to feel the motivation to pursue. My friends and I have played 400 hours of this game between us, and while we were satisfied and proud when we picked up certain ghost tells enough to make very educated and smug guesses, Mylings, Banshees, Onryos, Demons, Deogens, etc. There wasn't anything especially fun about divining the subtler ghosts. The knowledge that we would need to accrue to make this jump into the next tier of expertise was just too much to bother with for our little four player co-op group. Like, we wanted to unwind at the end of a long day of work, not sit and wait in rooms with two doors or record the time a ghost spent trapped in a smudged room or measure the distance of an affected electronic device during a hunt. I assume that as the game develops, more unique behaviour will be added to the more subtle ghosts. Demons and Onryos and Revenants are fine and fun and still scary, but I'd love to see enemies like Jinns and Raijus see a bit more variety. I even compiled a small list of cool pieces of unique evidence. Certain ghosts could be visible in the cursed mirror or respond differently to cursed items. Some ghosts could only ever be transparent even when hunting, whereas most ghosts become physical, or able to leave fingerprints on a player's back or shoulder, only able to spawn in certain weathers, such as fog or snow, or have a chance to manifest physically in the dots. In the end, I guess it doesn't matter too much. My friends and I ended up making a custom difficulty where we still have three pieces of evidence, but the ghost is mega aggressive and basically just starts hunting as soon as we walk through the front door. So we can have the stress of having fun hunts without having to sit and scratch our heads for ages over whether the ghost is aggressively throwing items or just passively throwing items. Moreover, despite the daily and weekly challenges, which is the game's concerted effort to keep you around, the gameplay could do with some diversification if Phasmophobia really is serious about having these reasons to keep returning. I honestly think eventually branching out to ideas similar to Forsaken Demonologist, i.e. having exorcism as an additional mode that can be appended to the end of the game, but it's your choice whether or not you want to leave instead of doing it, would add an extra stage and a brilliant bit of challenge. This would directly address the issue of having those times where you walk in and solve a case within the first 90 seconds of a task since there's always more reasons to head back in. Or even in those cases where you manage to identify the ghost by the skin of your teeth, having watched your whole team die and, and have to run in by the skin of your teeth again and seal this entity away forever, or wimp out and run back to the lobby and take less rewards. Having specific requirements per map or at a push per ghost type would be sick. Maybe you only need to ID the ghost on low difficulties, but on higher difficulties you have to exercise it as well. I know it's a pipe dream and it's a lot to ask, but it would be great. But what can I say? Phasmophobia just works. This prose section will be short and sweet, being that I just won't be repeating the compliments that I gave Phasmophobia throughout the first third of this video. The basic premise is refined and fun. You know, it's always nice to hop onto Phasmophobia for a few games. And this means that it can be built on since it's a stable foundation from which to branch off into a wider variety of mechanics, rather than being a shaky but pretty foundation that will crumble under extra unrefined weight. You know, it's good, it, it can manage itself. Plus, the addition of cursed objects was fantastic fantastic fun. No matter if I'm throwing a music box in through the front door, like pulling a pin from a grenade and listening to the chaos that unfolds inside, if we're diving out of the way of a broken Ouija board, if we're hiding upstairs pushing the pins on a voodoo doll while our ignorant friends toil away in the ghost room, waiting for that heart pin to pop, or if we're playing tarot card roulette, it's always fun. Next, Forsake. Where, Where are, are you? you? Pump factory. Chapel. Oh. As it stands, Forsake currently has the weakest incentive to keep people playing, despite having a web of skills that players can grind for and a selection of maps and difficulties to keep playing on. With the current depth of the gameplay, this is a game that maintains playable interest for a good few hours, but without making each task feel truly unique and challenging, I don't imagine many players are sitting down with Forsake for more than 10 hours. Still, 10 hours is more than I've spent with games like What Remains of Edith Finch, and I like that game, so if you're looking for a straight money's worth, there's still something to be gleaned from Forsake. And not every game does need to be a 200 hour bonanza, but if it wants to compete with the big boys relying on this model of randomly generated maps and randomly allocated ghosts with long term grind for gear and skills, it's not doing enough to keep people engrossed. I don't even have pros and cons for this, Forsake unfortunately scores quite low here. Demonologist. 
I think Demonologist has the most promise. And I know that a good few people have poured many, many, many hours into Demonologist, but there's always somebody who will pour many, many hours into oh, the most random game you've ever heard of. There are people who get home from a long day at work, put their feet up and play Secret Neighbour for fun until midnight and then they go to bed, you know? There's hours and hours of content is a compliment to a game, kind of, but it's no longer something I would pin as a badge of honour, more as a fact of content quantity, and sometimes not even that. I think the Demonologist has a broad skeleton of stages to a hunt, identification, objectives, exorcism, but they are thus far unrefined and the economy they sit on is shagged. It's like a Weatherspoon's pizza. The toppings are everywhere. Was this cooked in a centrifuge? There's just so much that doesn't work. Progress is deeply unsatisfying. Building off this frustrating in-game economy, you really cannot achieve that much in this game without the required sanity items. One of our final hunts before we gave up on this game forever involved us actually successfully identifying the ghost, woohoo, but then we were given three additional objectives and for the first time in a long time none of these required us to buy gear, which meant that we could do them. We had to find a silhouette in a chair using the ectoplasma glass. We had to grab three ghost orbs and we had to collect some dead rats and throw them in a cauldron that had been placed inside the house and we were really excited to see the exorcism stage so we got on with it nice and fast. However, our sanity had dipped too far. During these optional objectives, the ghost began hunting and killed us both, and we missed out on a chance to try the exorcism stage after playing over 10 hunts each apiece. Without sanity items and defensive items like crucifixes, of which it's hardly worth buying anyway, since death means you lose them, you won't get far enough to exorcise the ghost and earn the money you need to buy things. Demonologist is so unwilling to give you the tools that would make early levels a little bit easier to grapple with, nor the space to try these different tools in, nor the drip to do it in, that you never feel like you're getting anywhere. And alongside the inconsistent ghosties, the exhausting deluge of jump scares and bad volume mixing, and the incredible weight for some pieces of evidence, it's not something you ever want to come back to. Alongside this refusal to provide you with any items of substance beyond the basics, dissuading you from taking risks and diving back into the house for one final adrenaline filled push, Demon Demonologist's system of progress is very slow. The economic loop in Demonologist is self-defeating. Why grind for items you will lose while grinding for the next items you need. Like, the game is inherently deeply dissatisfying. There's so little incentive to push forward, especially after a team wipe where you've lost everything. Every time my friends and I put Demonologist on the table to play later, it would never be, do you want to play Demonologist later? We would keep saying, do you want to give Demonologist another try? And I think that that wording was so telling. Overall scores. We're almost there. This script has legit taken me literal weeks. It's 37 pages long. This is the longest script I've ever written, and I've spent weeks playing these games over and over. Weeks of, shall we try Demonologist again tonight? Weeks of tapping the clip this button whenever something scared me half to death, or screamed in my ear, or I tripped and fell on the accidental fat jump scare button. But it's been a really fun and worthwhile few weeks. I've had some amazing laughs. I've taken the opportunity to spend some really quality quality time with my friends, and now I'm ready to deliver my final thoughts on each of the games. So let's conclude this mega project together, but also keep in mind that I've been playing these games for weeks, I've really enjoyed them, and even for the ones that I see issue with, they're still worth giving a go to, so if you're interested in any of the games I talk about today, and this is not sponsored, I'm not being told to do this, I do recommend you pick them up, give them a go for yourself, let me know what you think. Phasmophobia. At time of writing, Phasmophobia is still heads and tails above the rest. Well done. Were we ever even surprised? <laughs> Forsake. Forsake is the weakest of the three right now, but I think it has the potential to grow beyond Phasmophobia and Demonologist in an entirely different direction. It does gripping, high-intensity gameplay so well. So well that it could never step in their quiet, contemplative, guess who, Ghost Edition footsteps, but that doesn't mean it couldn't be its own behemoth. I feel like if Forsake lets go of its association and tries to do its own thing, it could really be something good. Demonologist. Demonologist is, to be polite, a big, hot, steaming pile of wank. Mainly 
great because I look at it and I see the silhouette of greatness. But when I look closer, it just jumps out and screams in my face with big googly eyes. And I hate myself because a bit of piss rolls down my leg and there's nothing I can do about it. The developers also have a penchant for releasing very flawed games and then abandoning them, never to be updated or improved again. So I'm sure my suggestions are a waste of my own time and yours. I would pay Demonologist a modicum of respect, but it would probably cost me 1600 in-game dollars. Oh, I haven't defrosted my chicken goujon. GG's guys, we've done it. I hope you enjoyed this video. It was excellent fun to write and even better fun to film. Stick around to the end of the video and I'll even drop some highlights and some bloopers that didn't make it into the video for time or efficiency's sake. And you can see me lose my rag at a few things that probably shouldn't have scared me as much as they did. If you enjoyed the video, please drop a like, subscribe for more. I cover all sorts of things, gaming, TV, movie shite and I can't even believe I'm saying it at this point like I don't need to pitch my channel to you at this rate if you've stuck it in this far I think you think you know for certain whether or not you'd like to subscribe so don't know why I've even gone to the, the effort of pitching my channel but I'm glad you enjoyed the video if you did stick around thank you so much for being here again patrons in the link below and thank you again to Brilliant for sponsoring today's video I'm gonna go to bed good night everybody But my uncle used to leave were blinding. What? Yeah, I love finance. <laughs> <You'll> clip uh. that. <laughs> Jesus Man, what the fuck right. was that? <laughs> Who's just having a I shit? That was my... <laughs> <laughs> That's not me this time. Just gave oral birth. Why the fuck did uh, Discord <laughs> mute my screen that those get through? Does anyone know how to defrost bread quickly? You're such an asshole about that. I was hungover. I was tired. <laughs> my friends don't let me forget a fucking thing I say, Humpty. Coward. You, you can stay outside. I'll be a face. I wish to see the ghost. My girl's got the fucking whammiest thumbs I've ever seen. What I'm not gonna it? suck your dick, Walter. <gasps> oh. I've soiled myself. Who's that guy? I don't dare go in that room, that's where the loud jump scares happen. There's... Where are that statue in the basement? Oh, that one. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> I bet you're wondering why I gathered you all here today. Oh, <laughs> he's fat as fuck, do you see that? <laughs> I'm dead. Oh. That's tough, man. That is tough. In case you didn't see me do it, uh, I've been pulling tarot cards for like oh. a couple of minutes now. Well, that makes sense. I just saw a big fat lad coming up to the next thing I know. He's flying. It's like, the that's death, good. The death might have been something to do with the death card. And, um, that would but make I just sense. pulled an angel card, so I'm wondering if he's come back. Imagine comes sprinting in the room. Kex. There he is. Oh, hey, look at <laughs> <laughs> Jesse, Walter, put Walter's put dick away. Put your dick away, Walter. Jesse, put Walter's dick in my mouth. <laughs> Walter, just putting it off for so long, mainly because I just couldn't be bothered to. But I watched El Camino for the first time of the day. El Camino. It was okay. <laughs> what, what the, the fuck? fuck was that? There's just a fried egg in the fucking Where? walk. <laughs> Oh, you're yeah. telling me, you're telling me an egg fried this rice? <laughs> Wait, what the hell is it? Do it. Do it. Get ready to turn. What the fuck is that? Start singing on top of it. Oh, <laughs> piss off. <laughs> Look at that cat and coward. Oh, she's over here. Ghosty! <laughs> Ghosty! <laughs> Oh shit, catch. Nice. Check under that chair, there's like 20 Playboy magazines. Decades worth of skids. Like... Man's goon cave is on point, I, I respect it. I, to be fair, a couple, though. the Lucky darker the dingy, the better. I need to feel like I've done something wrong afterwards, so this is perfect. It's the same as mine, the single yeah. swinging exposed light bulb. A single exposed light bulb <laughs> with like a 30 year old armchair. Do it. Hiding. Why? Because I'm scared.
Oh fuck. Oh. <gasps> you fucker. Oh, what a lovely summer's eve. Goggle my nuts in your mouth, Walter. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think I want to hey, buy close, a lightning Walter. shower off this gym. I found like a twenty-five-year-old Princess Diana mug. <laughs> you Walter, you do it Eiffel now, Tower, Jesse. You Don't ask questions. You stop hunting or anybody? Oh, not sticky keys, you old bitch! <laughs> I fucking turn sticky keys off. <laughs> oh my god, I've turned it on and it keeps beeping. I can hear I it. Just heard the beeps. You just did a fucking oh don't raise me, I don't be back into the What are you doing in here? Please, not trying to raise the players. Look, get off on you. We'll just stand there. <laughs> uh, I can't do that. <laughs> yeah, drop kick her that scream as well. Oh no, I am man. Oh, there's a bear trap over here! Whoops! Yeah, but it's just slightly yeah, taking the piss here. The thing of us is coming. I'm high on the moon. Wait, you can hide in these? Oh my, that's awful. It is, I isn't it? I can see you! <gasps> oh my god! Frosted what, Hillary's? <laughs> you fucking young. I'm sorry, you why fucking... have you already shot? Oh, sorry. Is... Oh, I don't know where to buy blinds. I only know where to buy Ket. Fucking hell. Wait, <laughs> Get him in. I wish Big Bird did die at the challenge disaster. Where, where are, are you? you? Pump factory. Chapel. Chapel. Oh. <laughs> One of the boys in my year had his bag shit in there in PE. <laughs> oh, yeah, no. It's the same thing from yesterday. <laughs> oh, my nutsack. That's Gwyneth Paltrow. Oh, I'm dead. Bye. <laughs> Whee! See, I reckon this gaff would not get haunted if it just wasn't this fucking minging. Buongiorno! Get man, get fucking I had a face mask! Oh. Oh. <laughs> if he fucking, if he fucking runs away. <laughs> I'm an ego. Oh! The masturbatorium! Who snapped the toilet seats off the box and just left them on the floor? It's Mate, have you ever toilet. been to school? Yeah! yeah. <laughs> Jesse. Walter. It's a utility room. Oh, it's gotta be fucking seriously, man. Yeah, yeah, she said, I bet that daft dude's down here somewhere as well. Now you're laughing. <laughs> oh, the pair of you clowns. <laughs> you fucking caught us. us. You fucking. But turn around, but turn around. What's going to <laughs> 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 What if you killed poor Elliot there? How would you think you would feel? He is dead. Is he actually? I heard it. You two are worse. Condolences to my boy Elliot. I think he's dead. Uh oh. 
<laughs> oh dear. This is Give me one, eat the ball. <laughs> oh, Buttercup! <laughs> Fuck off, you daft wench. Well, that's all sorted. Hey, guys, don't you wish to see the ghost? I wish to see the ghost. I don't want to see the ghost. I wish to not see the ghost. <laughs> 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 <laughs>